Syzygy, episode 63, a pair of Delta Scooty Lambda Boos. Well, welcome back to another edition of the Syzygy podcast. This is uh, this is episode 63, and it's an interesting one because, you know, normally I'm sitting opposite her at her office table, Dr. Emily Brunsden. We're, we're not in your office, Emily. Where are you at the moment? Well, I'm in the dining room. <laughs> but not my dining room. No. I'm up in the, in the box room upstairs, but not in your... Where, where, where are you? I'm in Preston at the moment. I'm in lockdown. You're in Preston. Right, and I'm in lockdown in York, and so even if we wanted to get together to record this podcast, as we normally do in the same place at the same time, we can't do that because that's not allowed anymore. We have to, we all have to, what, socially, social distancing, self-isolation, where we're all distanced and isolated at this point. How are you doing? I'm not too bad, actually. It's a nice sunny day. I had lunch outside on the terrace, had a cheeky cider with lunch, not something I normally oh. do at work. So oh, well, well lubricated for a podcast recording then. Well done. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice day today. I'm looking out the window and it's blue skies and I'm thinking I, I could actually do this a bit, bit more often. I think I think this is not a bad thing. Should we give but it another getting... three weeks and see how we go? <laughs> yeah, I think I think after a couple more weeks of of lockdown with my entire family in the one house, that could get a bit much. I don't know, but for the time being, everyone's still alive and we're we're just getting on with it. So, you know, heads up to everyone out there in lockdown land. If you're if you're listening to this, then um, keep going, keep doing the the right thing, and we'll get through this together. But we're not here to talk about that today. We're here to talk about astronomy. Emily, what's been going on? Apparently, well, you've is, been in the news again lately. Something to do with a full moon? Yeah, it, it, it's it's a strange thing. It's like when the full moon comes out, then the where Emily comes out. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that's just never going to give up, is it? You've, no. you've become the the go to person for full moon. So, what is it this time? Uh, so t- tonight, moon? actually, so as we're recording this, so we're recording this, this on Tuesday, the April the 7th. 7th of April, that's right. Uh, we have our three, third out of four supermoons of 2020. Wait, there's another one still to go? We've got another oh one in goodness. next month. So, you know, if you've missed it this month, then keep, keep your eyes and ears All out right. for next month's uh, supermoon. So, so backing up, when was the first one? Was it January or February? January, yeah. January and that was that oh, sorry, was no, it must be February, s- February, February, March, April, May. Four. Was it the was it the snow moon in February or was it something else? Uh, the, the, wolf, the plant moon, moon the plant the moon. bird so moon, the luck second lockdown moon. Is this, is that a one? <laughs> COVID nineteen moon. What's this one? This one is the pink moon. The pink moon. Of course it is because all the flowers are coming out, and so it's a nice shiny pink colour because of all the reflected light from the flowers. Is that how that works? Uh, yeah, not quite. <laughs> sure. Why not? Why not? And uh, and so, as you say, if you miss this one, I mean, by the time you listen to this podcast, it'll have been and gone and you'll have missed the pink moon. But coming up next month, there's another one, another super moon, which is the what? Uh, oh, um, I don't know. It's got another name. Worm. Got another name. Worm. worm I feel worm like worm is super- a good one. Super worm moon, super pink worm moon, one of those. Anyway, so you've been contacted about this. You're having a chat to some journalists. Yeah, so about, I had a, uh, I had a chat with the press office uh, this morning, and yeah, got a couple of radio interviews perhaps to see it this afternoon. So we'll, uh, I'll, I'll reassure everyone: the moon isn't going to turn pink. It isn't going to crash into the <laughs> earth. Uh, it's just going to look really nice in the night sky. And uh, yeah, you know, maybe it's a good time to start some backyard astronomy. Have you? Um... Have you managed to squeeze in any really good nonsense bits to this story? I mean, after doing this is three out of four, after doing three out of four of these, surely by now you must be crowbarring in a, well, the thing you don't know about the moon is this. It's actually made out of aluminium. I don't know. Like, could you, could you, could you get well, something in there? I did sneak in a cheeky thing saying the moon is going to be its biggest at half past three in the morning. Oh, you wanted to get people out of bed? I'm hoping for it. At least a couple of people <laughs> might fall for that one. And it's going to be huge. You will not believe how big it is. Yeah. I actually had this conversation with my with my daughters a little while ago. Um, again, you know, this this just keeps coming up. The whole, is the moon bigger near the horizon or is it not bigger near the horizon thing? And I was able to refer them back to our previous podcast where we tore this one apart and said, no, it is not. Go and measure it. It's just an optical illusion. They didn't believe me. I was going to say, <laughs> just because just your dad has a podcast on it. 
I know, but, you know, it was worth a try. Worth <laughs> a try. If I can't stamp out a misconception in my own household, what's, what hope have we got anywhere else on the planet? Anyway, so that's moon news. What are we talking about today, Emily? Something to do with a lopsided star. Yeah. Talk me through this one. What's going on? A wobbly star that's only wobbling on one side. Which, forgive me for saying so, doesn't sound like the sort of thing that a star should be doing. So what? Well, this is this is really, really exciting. So this has come from um, some work from a group of astro-seismologists, and not just any old astro-seismologists. In fact, uh, the lead author of this paper, um, Handler, Gerald Handler, was actually my uh, external examiner for my PhD. So, ah, so well, this is right, right in your wheelhouse, Emily. This is really, I can tell this one's got you excited. Oh, well, you know, it's done by some of the best uh, astronomers in the world, of course. <laughs> of course. Well, they gave me a PhD, so, you know, I've got to, got to pay some respect <laughs> back. Fair enough, fair enough. So astro seismology, which we will remember, is like earthquakes, except on stars. Starquakes, you're, you're studying how the surface and the interior of stars are wibbling and wobbling about. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the, yeah, okay. a star that's pulsating on just one half, one hemisphere, if you like. And it's the very, right. very first one we've ever discovered that's doing this. That does sound a little bit odd. I mean, I know, I know on Earth we do get earthquakes that happen in particular places, right? That there is an earthquake off the coast of, you know, Japan or something. And that's very localized. But, I mean, the shock waves go all around the planet and you can pick them up elsewhere. You don't, I don't tend to associate that kind of localization with a star, how can a star, which is a big fluidy thing, have such a pronounced only on one side kind of pulsation? What's going on? Yeah. So when you normally think about a pulsating star, you think about like a traveling wave that travels around the surface of the star. So you might have one part of the star go in and the other part goes out, but then that reverses and the other half changes over sides. But uh, this is happening just on the one half because the star is in a binary system. Ah. Okay, so this changes everything because when you've got a binary system, then you've got another star or something pretty big nearby pulling on it. So that's making all the difference here. That's why it's one-sided. Yeah, so the gravity or the effect from the other star is actually changing the entire shape of this pulsating star and it's pulling it into kind of a teardrop kind of shape. And it's during that pull that it's causing a, an amplification of the pulsations on one side of the star. Now, here's the kicker. We don't actually know whether it's the side of the star that's pointing towards the binary or if it's the other one, other side. That, it does kind of seem to me that that's the sort of thing you ought to be able to, to pin down. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. Let's back up. What is this star? Where is it? How do we know? Give well, us some details. Yeah, so this is a great star. It's um, HD 74423. Might uh, be one, one of, of your favourites. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, observed with the Tess... Uh, spacecraft. So this is the Transiting mm -hmm. Exoplanet Survey Satellite, our favourite, favourite space telescope on Syzygy. And the cool thing was that this particular star was uh, first looked at by some citizen scientists who were looking at the light curves of all hundreds and hundreds of different stars and just trying to say, well, what, can we find something interesting? What's different? What's new? What, what haven't we seen before? Were and, they looking at data from TESS or yeah. was this, is this prior to TESS? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So no, the TESS data are public. You can go and have a look through them and, you know, enjoy them to your, to your heart's content. Uh, so, yeah, so some citizen scientists were looking at the data, picked out this particular star and said, hey, this is doing something that's a little bit weird. Why don't we have a look at this? And uh, got some astroseismologists on board and then figured out what was actually happening. So, cool. uh, and of course, TESS, TESS is, I mean, it's the, the transiting exoplanet survey satellite, but what it's looking for is interesting changes in the, the brightness or other variables of, of the stars. And so, you know, we talked about this before, that could either be a planet going across in front of the star, or it could be something else. It could be, as in this case, a star which is doing a bit of a weird wobble. And so oh, no. you could use oh, no. the same telescope to find stuff. Uh, yes, so, no, you yes the... so you're quite right. So if you want to see the very, very small drop in light that you get from a planet passing in front of a star, then it turns out you stare at that star and measure its brightness over time. But if you want to measure how uh, that star is pulsating, you also stare at that star and measure its brightness over time. So it's very, very useful to have the one mission that does lots of different types of science. Which is very cool. And I remember when TESS launched, your particular excitement about it was not just, hey, we might find some really cool planets, 
but it's going to be really useful for all of this stuff as well, which, as we mentioned, is right in your wheelhouse. OK, so this is it was found by some citizen scientists and they threw it to the astro seismologists. And what have they found? OK, so this was a known binary system and it's actually a really interesting binary system all on its own anyway. So there's two stars, we call them A stars, which is the type of star that's there. Uh, they are A star means that they're a little bit bigger, a bit bigger and a bit hotter than the sun. So while our sun is something like 6,000 Kelvin, 6,000 degrees on the surface, these types of stars might be around 8,000 uh, on the surface. So a bit hotter and a bit bigger. Okay. Um, I think, for example, the the, the HD 774423, sorry, is about 1.7 solar masses. So one and a half, okay. one and, just a bit over one and a half times the mass of the sun. So it's a bit bigger. It's not sort of stupidly big supergiant or anything like that. It's just a bit bigger than the sun. Okay. Yeah. And these two stars are in a really, really close binary. So the binary orbit time is less than two days. Well, that is close. So how far apart would they be relative to stuff that we know, like, you know, our own planets? Mercury, for example. I mean, Mercury's got an orbital period of, of what did we say? Months? 88 days. 88 days, right. So this is a lot closer than Mercury. These are really in nice and tight. Yeah, these are really, really close. So they're similar to kind of some of the closest exoplanets that we have. Wow. Um, but during this orbit, so it's um, just over one and a half days in total, the time that the two stars take to orbit each other, uh, they change distance from each other so it's in what we call a centric orbit so at some points they're really really close together and then at some points they move further apart so i i did get some some really i mean it's pretty amazing so you can go from in some cases having just a few radii of the stars apart all the way out wow. to being 10 times or more that distance wow i mean that's really close like you'd expect at that point that they'd be pretty much tearing each other apart well, they're actually starting to, which is why you get this kind of teardrop shape. So when the stars are nice and close, then you get this sort of tugging onto the star. And so that's what's causing this amplification of the pulsations. Now, the pulsations themselves are kind of ordinary sort of pulsations that we would expect in some of these types of stars. They're called delta scuti pulsations. And mm -hmm. uh, Del Scuti stars are kind of one of the bigger um, types of pulse classes of pulsating star. We know lots and lots of Del Scuti stars that we are studying uh, that are also these A stars. It turns out that not all A stars are pulsating, but we don't quite know the reason for that. But lots of them are. And so they have these, these types of pulsations. Uh, but what happens is that the amplitude of those pulsations changes in step with the orbital frequency. Right. So uh, just pulling that one apart then, if you've got an orbital frequency which is changing, sometimes it's closer and sometimes it's further away, is that is that what you mean? Then that's going to mean that you're messing around with those pulsations somewhat. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, a good handy thing to think about in, in relation to this would be the Earth and the Moon and how we get tides from that system. Yeah. So when you have the Moon, you have a tide which is on the side – uh, which is closest to the moon, and that's gravity pulling up kind of the surface of the earth or the tide, the uh, oceans of the earth. Uh, you get another tide on the opposite side, which is caused by the inertia of that whole system. So you can imagine this is in a similar way. You get this sort of teardrop bulge, which is the always on the side of the star, which is facing its companion. Now, in this case, we think that this is a fairly circular-ish orbit. So it might not be quite as extreme as some of the other binary pairs, like these ones that go change 10 times by radius. But it's at least you've always got one side of the main pulsating star that's facing its companion. Right. I, I, so, sorry, I'm a little bit confused. I thought you were saying a minute ago that this one, it changed from as close as days to as much as 10 times further out. Or were you just talking about these kinds of these stars? These kinds of stars, yeah. Right. So there's a whole right. class of stars which we can delve into, which are called heartbeat stars, which show this kind of phenomenon in a similar way. Gotcha. Okay. That was that was my mistake. So in this case, how how close are the stars orbiting? So, well, we they must be very, very close. I'm not sure if I, I didn't write down the exact orbital distance, but they are, you know, 1.6 days is really, really close. And yeah. then... 
what happens is as that if you these are um, close to being eclipsing binaries, they're not actually eclipsing. So you don't get one passing in front of it, the other from our line of sight. But they're close to being aligned that way because what we can see is that sometimes when the um, pulsating star is showing the face towards us that's pulsating is because the uh, other star is kind of in between us and the pulsating star. And then sometimes the pulsating star has that pulsating side pointing away from us because the right. other star is on the other side. Yep, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, so... You said uh, you said way back that not even entirely sure which direction the pulsating bit is is pointing, whether it's pointing towards or away from. It, it's it's binary yeah, because neighbor. what we're seeing is we don't actually get to see these two stars doing their orbit. We can't look at the whole surface and say, oh, okay, it's that side that's pulsating, the one that's facing it, or the one that the side that's facing away from it. It's either of those two options. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah, but because what we're actually seeing when we look at, uh, say, the data from TESS is the integrated light from both of the stars put together, right? So we're getting, seeing the whole the whole surface all coming down to just one single data point. And that doesn't tell you quite enough information as to which side the star's pulsating on. No. So, I mean, I've got in my mind's eye, which comes up on this podcast quite a lot. It should be its own character, I think. We need to give it a name. But in my mind's eye, I'm imagining this thing, right? I'm imagining one star and another star, and they're orbiting around their sort of common center. And they're, they're really close, and so they're affecting each other really quite strongly, and I can see that. But that's not what the telescope's seeing the telescope's not not able to image of that level of detail by any stretch of the imagination is it it's only able to see basically a dot but that dot is changing its brightness over time and you've got to sort of work backwards from there to say well hmm okay what is going on here is that right that's right yeah so if this was a star kind of just on its own and it was doing a normal delta scuti pulsation where the whole star was pulsating then you just see the light the brightness change uh, kind of sinusoidally uh, over time so you'd see it go brighter than dimmer then brighter than dimmer and brighter and dimmer and it would have this really nice pattern that you'd be able to see you could pick out the different frequencies of the pulsations and it would kind of it would be your very um, standard but very interesting delta scuti star now, because this is in this binary system, it's, it's sometimes got the pulsating side facing towards us and sometimes the pulsating side facing away from us. So that changes the amplitude or the strength of those light variations that we see. And in this case, it's pretty dramatic. It's by a factor of 10 times. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, I've just, it's just occurred to me, I mean, get, getting away from this teardrop shaped star at all, you're detecting the fact that it's a binary star system. And you said it was already known that it was, presumably because you're, you're seeing a, a, a periodic variation of the brightness of, of the dot that you're imaging, right? It's, it's still just a dot. You're not seeing the two dots separately. You're not seeing the two stars. And they're incredibly close together anyway. But you are seeing a periodic variation on that, which is the orbit of the two stars around the common center. Yeah? Yeah, that's right. But then you're looking, you're looking on top of that to see deeper within this signal the variation that's due to one of these stars pulsating on top of that variation already. Is that right? Yeah. So the variation from the binary, we can't actually just see from the brightness variations directly because it's just you just get to see the sum total of the light from the two stars. It's just all mixed together into one right. single data point. Okay. When you can see that is if you do spectroscopy, because what you do is you break up the light into its different colors. You get to see what we call spectral lines. And those are you get in the spectrum of this um, system, you get two independent sets of lines that are moving differently. So right. one star is moving towards you, one star is moving away from you. So one star looks a little bit bluer in its spectrum, one star looks a little bit redder, and then that, that changes over as the binary goes round. But they have their own specific fingerprints. So it's like each star has got its well, its own characteristics within the spectrum, its own lines coming from its particular mix of chemicals within the star. And you're able to say, no, that bit there, that's that star. And this bit there, that's that star. And one of them's moving away, one of them's moving towards, and then they swap places. So that's how you tell that it's a binary. Yeah, yeah? and that's how you can measure the period of the binary very, very accurately without right. even okay. going to the test data. So that was, that was known beforehand. Uh, and 
then once you go into the test data and you start saying, well, hang on, it looks like the amplitudes of the pulsations here are changing. Oh, and they're changing at exactly the same period as the binary period. Then you start to get suspicious. Gotcha. Gotcha. So is this the first time that, that this kind of thing has been seen? Have we, have we seen this kind of weird one-sided pulsation before? We haven't ever. So this is the very, very first one. Um, they were, however, predicted decades ago when we started thinking about what pulsations might look like in lots of different types of stellar systems. Well, there was no reason to think that if you had a close binary that that would interact with the pulsations and cause one half of the star to to pulsate with a higher amplitude. So it's very exciting that we finally found them. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So there presumably must be others out there. I mean, there must be loads of candidates of, of, you know, binary stars which are orbiting reasonably closely. We've seen a lot of them. I mean, do I remember correctly you saying that, that there are a lot of binary systems out there? Yeah, well, we think more than half of all stars in our galaxy are in some kind of binary, maybe even triple or even up to i think the record is about six stars in one system at the moment that's which is nuts it's crazy it's really difficult to imagine as well because it's not kind of just six stars orbiting all the same thing we're orbiting each other it's kind of pairs so they're all paired up yeah um so orbiting with pairs around pairs and yeah weird so worth looking at at what point the caster system for that one at, at what point does does a, a six-star system just get called a very small galaxy? I don't know. <laughs> very so, okay. So, but my, my question was that there must be like loads of candidates for this if this is the first one of these weird kind of, you know, teardrop-shaped blobby things that we've seen. There's got to be other candidates out there. Yeah, well, interestingly enough, we found uh, this whole system or this whole class of pulsating binary stars uh, called heartbeat stars several years ago. And these were these are stars that are again pulsators in binaries, but they're just slightly different. So these are ones where there might be these these eccentric ones like I mentioned before. So you can go from uh, where you can go from a few times the radius of a star out to ten times that. These uh, in these systems, and what that does is when the star is close, it tidally excites. Uh, gravity modes, so slightly different types of pulsations, which then resonate across the whole star. And what we see in those cases is we get to see lots of really high um, resonances of the period of the orbit itself. So if you were to imagine looking at um, what these stars look like in terms of their light curves or their um, change in brightness over time, they kind of look a little bit like uh, electrocardiograms. Oh, right. Right. So you so can, it's really cute what, you're, thing. what you're saying is you can see you, you've got the, this very clear orbital period of the binary system and what you're seeing various multiples of that, very, various harmonics of that sort of layered on top of each other as all these, all these different kinds of wobbles are adding up on top of each other. Yeah, that's exactly right. So like you have the harmonics in, in a musical um, sense and you get the harmonics uh, of these uh, pulsations in a similar way. And they, yeah, and then when you take the the like of it looks like this kind of yeah cute little echocardiogram like a heart which is why they're called heartbeat stars right i've only just pieced that together yeah that makes sense for once astronomy's come up with a really quite nice title for something yeah nice it's, it's something. nice isn't well it done. yeah yeah well done everyone so so that's those heartbeat stars are showing pulsations that kind of get excited by the tidal effects themselves so they're, they're the same frequencies but they're just higher harmonics of the orbital period and that's different to what we see here, which is that it's got the star's got its own independent pulsation that's being excited by the binary. So you said a while ago that you know if you if you look at this star, which is being sort of you know pulled out into a into a teardrop shape, we said that that it's possible that it's going to be sort of torn apart. I mean, these two stars are orbiting very close to each other, and the gravitational forces at that kind of distance must be extraordinary. Like, what's the fate of a system like this? Well, that's really interesting because it sort of depends on how much time these stars have. So when you're talking about these two that are interacting, effectively one star is pulling up a tide onto the other star, which means you're losing energy out of your orbit. So very slowly, these the orbits will decay, which means they get closer and closer together. Now, it may well be that... Uh, they get close enough that 
the one of the stars does um, an effect we call overfilling its Roche lobe. Just, uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it doesn't sound good. No, it's really not a good idea to overfill your Roche lobe. Uh, <laughs> What that means is that uh, you get to a point where you're pulling the surface of the star away from its center of mass so much that it gets to a point where it's more gravitationally attracted to its binary companion star than it is to itself. Wow. Okay. <laughs> what happens then? So then you get that mass transfer. Sound good. So you get this stream uh, of material which moves from one star onto the other. <laughs> that's, a, that's overfilling your Roche lobe. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and so at that point, your, your mass starts sort of sloughing off one star and spiralling over to the other star. And so that other star just gets bigger and bigger. That can't be good. No, so what, no. What, and this what is... happens in the end? Are you just left with one big star or one tiny star stripped of all its stuff orbiting around a really big star or what? Well, yeah, this is really interesting because – so if you have – this is a, similar to the situation we have for a type 1A supernova where you have uh, – in a type, terms of a type 1A, you've got a big red giant star that's overfilling its Roche lobe and pouring matter onto a tiny white dwarf star. And then eventually that white dwarf star just – can't hold up the mass that it's being poured onto it and it explodes in a supernova. Now these two stars are slightly different to that kind of system because they're two stars that are probably very similar. In fact, we don't actually quite know I think which star might be the bigger one. Uh, they're that similar, okay. Yeah, so they're both A stars um, and they're both very similar mass. So they'll probably evolve in a very similar way. So the question is, is it going to be that they get close enough to start mass transfer before they start to kind of kick in, become red giants or will the red giant phase themselves start mass transfer? Now, when you start pouring mass off one star and onto another, it it's a very unstable kind of system, right? You're, you're yeah. messing with like stuff. Like that's got to really, that's got to, that's got to affect things quite dramatically, and and it's got to affect the the evolution of that. Like the path that that star was going to go down is not going to go down anymore. Yeah, is that likely to sort of you know speed up the the evolution of the star? I mean, the evolution of the stars is is down to how it's sort of burning away its fuel down in the core as much as anything else. So. What does it what does it do? What does it do to a star to suddenly start throwing stuff at it? Yeah, well it's interesting. I think you might get a situation where you get a nova. So these are more like these um, sort of more ordinary two stars, uh, whereby you're pouring mass onto another, that mass becomes unstable, it flares up and it becomes a big sort of mini explosion. So these were the original right. novae before we had right. supernovae. So it's not a not a supernova, it's just a nova. Yeah. So it's kind of like a big explosion. You still where... wouldn't want to be standing one standing next to one, but it's not crazy. No, you sort of yeah. You you pour enough matter onto the star that becomes just a bit unstable, and it kind of has an explosion and sheds off some of that material, and nice. that can be periodic or more likely. Most novas are just kind of random eruptions. So that could happen, or something else. Who knows? <laughs> watch watch this space. But I'm guessing that this is not something that is going to happen over a you know a short time frame. It could happen over a very long time. Yeah, that's right. And I guess the final thing that's interesting, I guess, about these two stars is that not only are these two stars very similar in terms of their um, type of star, their temperatures, their masses, etc., they're also both, interestingly, a really rare type of star, which is called a Lambda Boo star. Okay, hang on. A la Sorry, a Lambda Boo star. Lambda Boo. You just... You're just making these names up now. <laughs> tell me, do tell me, Emily, what is a Lambda Boo star? So, yeah, so Lambda Boo stars are named after the first star that was discovered to be like this, which happened to be Lambda Bootus. Of course, okay. So they're called Lambda Boos. Uh, what they are is they're extremely metal poor stars. So what that means is that they don't have a lot of the normal metals, uh, so this is anything except hydrogen and helium, that you would expect that's from right. Stars. I've forgotten in astronomy, metal is anything but hydrogen and helium. Yeah. yeah. But, Chemi so, chemistry be damned. What do they know? We'll just do it our way. Exactly. So, well, hydrogen and helium are pretty much the only things that matter, and then the rest is just <laughs> stuff. I mean, to be fair, it is an extraordinarily large amount of the universe. But anyway, so when you're talking about metal poor stars, you're talking about stars which are almost exclusively hydrogen and helium. 
Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, so for some reason, they didn't get all these other metals like iron and magnesium and that sort of thing. Uh, and that's really weird because they kind of should have. Uh, they're not super old stars. They're reasonably young stars. So a normal so A star will have stuff. a lot of this stuff. There should have been enough of this other stuff kicking around at that point for the star to have a lot of not hydrogen and helium, a lot of the, the astronomical metals. But these don't. And you're saying both of the stars seem to be that kind. Yeah, and that maybe that does kind of make a bit of sense because both stars in this binary were formed probably from the same cloud of gas and dust right. from the interstellar medium. So you'd expect them to have very similar compositions. That um, makes sense. And although we haven't quite really figured out 100% where these Lambda Boo stars sort of come from, one of the suspicions is that maybe they've accreted a whole lot of um, gas from the interstellar medium that was, for some reason, metal poor. So they're just sort of hoovered up there. I mean, is it a, a matter of being, you know, in a place at a time? There isn't really any other re reason than these stars formed in a place where that just happened to be what was around. And they, they hoovered up a bunch of gas and dust, and that's what they got. Yeah, you know, yeah, deal for some reason. And we don't really quite exactly know that reason. But um, <laughs> it's quite interesting. So less than 2% of A stars, so this type of temperature and massive star, are actually these lambda boost stars. And it turns out that now we've got not only a pair of them that are really interesting, we've got a pair that have – one of them has these delta scuti pulsations – and it turns out that they're only on one side of one of the stars. So it's one of these amazing systems that it's just piling on interesting stuff on top of one another. Okay, so Emily, I can, I can see now after we've been chatting about this for the best part of half an hour, I can see why someone in your particular field would get excited about a teardrop shaped pair or you know, one of a, a pair of stars which are themselves interesting stars to look at. But I kind of got to come back around to so, I mean, this this appeared in the newspapers. I saw this actually out there in the in the mainstream press. Why do we why do we care about this? What's the bigger picture here? Well, I guess the first thing is we well, we found the first one, and that's always exciting. But it gives it's always us, good to get a first. It's always good to get a first. But it gives us this um, ability to understand how stars behave in terms of both pulsations and tides, sort of interacting with one another. We can. It's very easy to forget that stars are these kind of fluidy things, right? They're not just balls of fire sitting there burning away. They are, you know, these complex plasmas where you've got motion on the surface and that motion is governed by the forces around them. So we can start to put together more complex pictures of actually how stars work from that. It, it sounds a bit like this system is is kind of an astro-seismologist playground that, that you need to go and find interesting and complex systems to be able to say, all right, let's figure this one out. Because if you don't have a complex system, there isn't particularly complex behaviour. That's right. And one thing which I pulled out of the, it's actually in the very first paragraph of the, the paper itself, the, it's on uh, the Nature Astronomy paper. And I really, really liked the way this was phrased. It was sort of talking about precision in the universe. So we've talked about before how astroseismology is a way to do extraordinary precision in terms of star interiors. And it's by far the most precise way we can measure things like core mass and age of a star. And that's already very, very exciting. But then binary stars are the way that we do precision in terms of global stellar parameters so these are things like how do you actually measure the mass of a star well binaries are the way that we can actually solve those properly and get really accurate um, numbers for those and putting both of those two things together in the same system allows you to get for get precision on both of those types of measurements and it's from these types of systems that we then extrapolate and draw our models of all the other stars that aren't in binaries and all the other stars right. that aren't pulsating. That, that makes sense. I mean, when you think about it from the point of view of, you know, a, a star when you're observing, it really is just a dot. And you, all you can do is say, well, let's, let's see what we can figure out from the light that's coming from that dot. And a star by itself, there's, there's only so many bits of information that you can get out. You've got a lot of parameters. The stars are actually quite complicated things, but there's only so many ways that you can get at all of those different parameters, the, the, the structure, the mass, the size, and all of that sort of thing. But the more complicated you can build up the, the situation that the star is in, its environment, 
the more you can dig at those different parameters and go, well, we could we could get at its mass from over here, but we could get at its composition from over here. And if we put these things together, then we get this. It's, it is. It's a playground. Yeah, and we have to remember stars are the building blocks of the entire universe. So if you know how to do masses correctly, if you know how to do stellar evolution correctly, then you can evolve a galaxy properly. Then you can, once you can evolve a galaxy properly, you can evolve the universe properly. So these whole things tie into the biggest questions of all. All right, well, we've got to wrap this one up for today. It's nice to be uh, back in the podcast saddle again, Emily. We had a little little bit of a break while the world shifted on its axis slightly, trying to figure out how do we operate in, in, a, in an environment, in a world where no one's actually allowed to go to work anymore, except for the people who are saving people's lives and keeping those people fed and so on. So it's nice to be back doing a podcast, is my point. It is, it is. And you don't smell as much this way. Ah, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm just going to just going to let that one pass on through. Um, listen, Emily, if people wanted to get in touch with us, if they had a question or a comment or something they wanted to share with us, there's got to be a way that they can do that. Please do tell. Well, thank goodness we still have the Internet. Because it turns out oh, that the internet... Thank goodness for the internet. <laughs> the internet is how you do, do all of the things the that you need to do with Syzygy. So oh my God. the internet is where you can find Twitter. So we are at Syzygy Pod, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y Pod yes. on Twitter, on the internet. We are on Instagram, Syzygy Pod again, on the internet. We are at, on Facebook... Yes. Which is, again, Syzygy Pod. Facebook, which is also on the internet. It yes, is on the yes, internet. Yes, just go and find us on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're not really into the social medias, then you can just go and find us at our website, syzygy.fm, where you can find all of the past episodes, all of the show notes, all of the pretty pictures that we put up with those, uh, going all the way back to episode one, 63 episodes ago. So before we sign off completely, if you want to help the show, then there's one way that you can do that. You can tell people about it. We'd love to be sharing our stories of the cosmos with as many people people as humanly possible so the best thing you can do is tell your friends even better go to your podcast catcher of choice and give us a review give us some stars lend us a few words well chosen which will help us to rise up through the noise and more people can find us and the fabulous stories that we tell about the universe but until next time emily will catch up again in a week or so for another brilliant story about the cosmos until then we'll catch Catch you later later. see everybody bye-bye See a body. See a body? <laughs> no, you don't see anybody these days, Chris. That's I the point. S- and yes, that's the point. Yeah, yeah. God, I'm so socially isolated. I don't even know how to talk. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Scooty Lamb the Booze. I mean, this sounds like something from the Teletubbies. Really? <laughs> you really need to come to some of my conferences. It's just silly. Just silly. <laughs> Oh dear, I think I've lost you. Oh, I've lost you. I've lost you. You're frozen and you're frozen with a slightly grumpy face. Mm, Oh dear.